So, um, thank you all for coming. And uh, last night, we got to hear about uh, the, uh, how close we are to the Lord's coming. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, I think the thing that many, many of us, what Christians, we Christians need to realize is that, and I think this is something that John talked about last night, is that there is a, a reward for us Christians. When the Lord comes back, He's going to establish His kingdom on this earth. The goal for us Christians is not to go to heaven. The goal for us Christians is with God to reign, to establish His kingdom on this earth. The earth is the battleground. It is what God is fighting over. He's, he wants to gain it back. And our role in, in this is to reign together with Him in His kingdom. And when He comes back, He's going to set up this kingdom on earth for a thousand years. But this kingdom is not given to just anybody. If I'm a Christian, although I, I really believe I'm saved, I received the Lord as my Savior, but in my daily life, there's no change. I don't care at all for what God wants. I don't, I don't spend time with Him. I don't even think about Him. I'm, all I do is I'm busy with my career. I, maybe I've made a lot of money. And, you know, I, I'm living my own life. And I don't, but I have no concern for the Lord. Do you think I'm qualified to receive the inheritance, the reward of the kingdom, to rule together with Christ? It doesn't make any sense. You know, if I was going to hire somebody to work for me, and this person doesn't care for the company, doesn't care for the job, while he's sitting at his desk, he's just running a side business. I've known people that have done that. They're, they're hired to work for this company, but on this side they're doing their own thing, planning their vacation maybe, <laughs> right, or whatever it is. You don't care what's going on. Do you think if your boss walks by and asks you, what did you do today? And you told him, oh, I was planning my vacation. <laughs> And I've, that's all I did today. I didn't do anything. Do you think your boss would be very happy? You know, even in the world, it's, it's, it makes sense. It's common sense. If you don't care about something, why would anybody give you that thing? Right? It doesn't make any sense. So, for the kingdom of God, if I have no concern for His kingdom, for what He wants, all I care about is myself, or my own things, what I want to do, why do you think God would give me this reward? You know, if you look at the Bible, somebody, very well-known apostle, Paul, right, he said, at the end of his life, he said, I have finished the race, I have gained the crown, I have waited, I have the crown of righteousness waiting for me. And then you read about how he lived his life, how he, he gave everything for God's kingdom. He served him faithfully. He was he endured so much persecution. He all his educational background and his former status, he counted it as rubbish. It was nothing to him. And all he cared about was advancing God's goals and his kingdom, taking care of the church, praying without ceasing. Right? All of this suffering so much for Christ. And then he could, could be qualified to say, I have finished the race. I have, you know, he realized that it was a race. Many of us don't even realize it's a race. And he said, I have, you know, I'm, I've done it. I'm finished. Now I have this reward, this crown. What type of person wears a crown? A clown? Or a teacher? What kind of person wears a crown? A king. That means he, he's qualified, he's ready to rule together with Christ. Right? He's done it, he's finished. 
and you look at what he went through in his life. And then you, I compare myself to him and I, I fall even compared to him. Don't even say compared to Christ, which is really our standard. And that even just compared to someone like Paul, I'm so short of that. You know, I even, you ask me to do a little something for the Lord and I'm complaining. Spend a little time with him and uh, I open the Bible and then uh, I start to fall asleep. <laughs> Right? The words don't get in. I have to read it over and over and over again. It doesn't get in. You know, my heart, and while I'm reading, I'm thinking about my job. I'm thinking about the next stock purchase or my next, you know, all my things. So how can, how can I possibly say, how can I possibly be ready? You know, and this reward is reserved for every one of us, every Christian. But the question is, do we care about it? Do we want it? Right? And, you know, it's something that God wants to make available. He wants us to have it. But the problem is, for many of us Christians, all we care about is just that we're saved. We're not going to hell one day. And Jesus can help me when I have a problem. When I have a problem, then I pray, Lord Jesus, please help me. But when everything is okay, then don't bother me. Right? Don't leave me alone. As long as my life is comfortable and happy, that's all I want. And this is really unfortunate. You know, it shows that we really do not see what the goal is. And maybe some of us we're not like that. We may say, well, at least I come, go to church. At least I go to the meetings and I do things for God. But even what we're doing, how do you know it was from the Spirit, the Spirit that told you that? How do you know it was, it's really according to the Word? Is it really for His kingdom? What is the real motive behind it? Right? So, you know, and there's still... in. I think in recently we've been spending a lot of time reading Matthew. And, I, and for me, personally, I've realized that it's really shown me that it's not, enough the, it's not enough just to do the right things or to say the right words. What really matters is my heart, my inward condition. A lot of people appear spiritual. They can do the right things, say the right things, wear the right clothes, whatever it is, have the right appearance. But when nobody's looking and they're by themselves or when they're with their own thoughts, the thoughts are somewhere else. The thoughts are not for the Lord. Many people, they serve the Lord, so-called serve the Lord, do things for God, but the real motive is just for themselves. Maybe it's for power, for control, for money, for self-recognition. That's exactly the problem that the Pharisees had. Even for us, you know, you, maybe you you're, uh, come to all the meetings and you participate and you do so many things. But is deep down inside, is it really for the Lord? Is it really because you love Him with your whole heart? your whole soul and your whole mind and your whole strength because you're doing it for the kingdom or is it because you want someone to say good job, Wu Chang, good job, right? You, wanna, you want congratulations. You want people to see, oh, he's a good Christian. He's a very good Christian. Is that what we want? So what really matters is the inward condition. And so I want to show you something here in Matthew chapter 5. <coughs> John referred to this as the uh, Constitution, part of it anyways. And um, you know, you can call it that because uh, when Jesus, the first, when he started his ministry, he was preaching about the kingdom of God, his kingdom. And the first thing the first significant, uh, I guess, message or speaking that he did was to really turn 
everybody's thinking upside down. And to show what, it, what is needed to be a citizen of the kingdom of God. You know, in the past, in the Old Testament times, people were thinking, well, as long as I keep the Jewish laws, then I'm good. You know, even today, there are some Christians who say, well, I don't eat shellfish, I won't eat pork, I, you know, I won't uh, even wear fabric of mixed materials. You know, people have many different ideas. You know, but it's not about the outward actions. If you read this and understand what it says here in Matthew chapter 5, 6 and 7, you'll see what the Lord is really talking about is our heart. Amen. Right? It is really about our heart. It's not about what we do. Okay? Let's look at a few verses here. Matthew chapter 5, verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Amen. You see, if you want, it doesn't say here, blessed are the saved. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That's what everybody thinks, right? Blessed are the ones who received me as your personal savior. Then this is the kingdom, yours is the kingdom of heaven. Yes, thank you for turning it down. I mean, up. Yeah, we need some air in here. Is that window, is it open? Let's try to maybe open a few windows. Okay. Yeah, it is open now. Thanks. Okay. No, that's to. Yeah, 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 right, right. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so let's take a careful look at this verse. Matthew chapter 5, verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You see here, even in this verse, it shows to receive the reward of the kingdom, there is a qualification. It's not for all Christians. You have to be at least poor in spirit. It doesn't, like I said, it doesn't say just saved. You believe in Jesus, therefore you get the kingdom of heaven. It it's goes further than that. Of course, obviously, to be poor in spirit, you must believe in Jesus. Right? That's clear. To be poor in spirit, it means that you have a humble heart to receive from the Lord. You're hungry for Him. You're thirsty for Him. You never feel like you know it all. You know enough. Especially if you've been a Christian a long time. You may say, yeah, yeah, I heard Matthew 5 before. I don't need to hear it again. I'm poor in spirit. I don't need to hear this. Well, that's not very poor in spirit. <laughs> right? You know, with the Word of God, you can always learn something new. I don't know how many times I've read Matthew chapter 5. I can't even count it. But every time I come to the Word, something new speaks to me. Not necessarily new knowledge, but just, just the Spirit telling me, hey, you need to work on this still. It's not some grand, glorious revelation, but sometimes it's just, you know, a prompting from the Spirit. You know, you're not really poor in spirit. And, you know, we really need to lower ourselves, to humble ourselves, to receive from Him. This is such a, a, a basic qualification. And that's why he said even that it is the little children that the kingdom belongs to. Right? You have to be like one of these, these little children. If we think we're such a great Christian, we're so experienced, so knowledgeable, then very difficult, impossible for new things to get in. You know, here also in um, Matthew, uh, same chapter, verse 7, right? It says, or verse 8, it says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Again, it's not just about salvation. 
but it says to be pure in heart. Amen. You know, a lot of us, especially Christians that have been believers for a while, we accumulate a lot of things. We have to clean out the old garbage sometimes, our old understanding. Sometimes, for me, I had to experience this many times. A lot of things I learned before, you have to question yourself. Is this really from the Lord? Or, or was that just something I heard, uh, an old traditional idea? Right? Be, to really be, um, to clear out all those things, right? To be, um, but also to really check, most of all, to check the condition of our heart. And I think one of the, one of the main um, burdens of this conference is that we realize that there are still, you know, in order for us to be qualified for the coming of the Lord in the kingdom, um, there are still many things that are hidden deep inside our heart that we don't realize. You may not even know about it yet. Right? And this is where the Lord has to show us. If you want to see God, you need to purify your heart. You need to clean it out. All the leaven, the, the sin, and the, you know, the, I don't know what you call it, the impurities, the defilement. So many things that are in our heart that needs to be cleaned out. You know, there's another verse also that I, that I found when I was preparing. In Second Peter chapter 1, verse 5, uh, chapter 1, Verses 5 to 11. Second Peter chapter 1, verses 5 to 11. Okay. Let's read it together. And, uh, you know, if you don't have a Bible, share with somebody. It's don't uh, just listen. It's always good to open the word and read it. Okay? But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self control, to self control perseverance, to perseverance godliness to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. And if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted, even to blindness, and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Don't you want that? To have an entrance supplied to us abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Don't you want that? Or you want a abundant entrance, entrance into the top university or the top company. That's what you want. What about an entrance into the everlasting kingdom? Amen. That, that implies, if you look at it carefully, you can, it tells you that it implies that if you don't do these things, the entrance will be very difficult. Right? You can read it the other way as well. That means the entrance to the kingdom is not guaranteed. It shows us again. And what does he talk about here? He says, he doesn't say just to have faith. But he says in verse 5, giving all diligence. How diligent are you? to pursue these things? Or are you just diligent to pursue knowledge and good deeds or other things, huh? It says, all diligence add to your faith, virtue, 
to virtue, knowledge. So you can't say we don't need knowledge. You definitely need knowledge, but it's not only knowledge. You need faith, virtue, knowledge. And I like the word add in verse 5. Are you adding? Is your Christian life adding? Are you building up more and more? Or are you just focused on love? I know some Christians, all they care about is love. Love, love, love. Love me, love you, <coughs> love everything, love everybody. And then without knowledge. And what happens if you have just love without knowledge? Then you'll start to accept everything. Everything is okay because we have to love everybody. Then it's a, it's a corrupted love. This is not real, really the right love. Right? If you have knowledge without faith, then you're just filling your head with deadness. Or if you have faith without knowledge, without virtue, you understand what I mean, right? You need self-control. That means the words that, you, that the Lord speaks to you, you need to implement it. When there's something that is not right in your life, the Lord tells you to stop it. You need to control it. You need to, it's not just feelings, but you have to sometimes apply it, right? I mean, all the time. You have to apply it, and you have to be diligent, and you have to exercise it. Yeah, uh, Self-control, perseverance, to, and, you know, because the race that we're running is not easy. You have to persevere. You have to fight on. Nobody said the Christian life is all sunshine, right? Even the Lord said there's going to be storms. There's going to be difficulties and suffering. And perseverance, you add to it godliness, right? Reverence and fear of the Lord. Brotherly kindness. So, again, it shows that we need the church life. We need the saints. We need the brothers and sisters. If you don't have any fellowship with brothers and sisters, you, all you do is you, you come on Sunday and then you disappear. You don't talk to anybody. Nobody knows you. Then how can you exercise, you, how can you add this brotherly kindness? And the real test of it is if someone disagrees with you. There is some conflict with a brother or sister. Can you still show this brotherly kindness? and this love right, to add. So our Christian life needs to be a constant adding. It has to be progress. It's not about outward actions. These are not outward actions. These start from within. They start from the heart. Do you understand? Does that make sense? You know, sometimes we, we're just so uh, caught up with trying to learn new things and new revelations, new teachings. But then the old teachings you haven't even, we haven't even practiced it yet, the basic things. We want to know, yes, we know the Lord is coming and we're waiting for that and you, we just want to hear about that. But then what about the most basic things, like dealing with the leaven in our heart? That's why this Peter, what Peter wrote here is so important. It talks about many very simple, basic things that we need to deal with. And he, sh he, does, he says here, if you add to these and, and diligently pursue them, it says here, you will, and you are, verse 10, you are diligent. Again, that word diligent, to make your call and election sure, and you will never stumble. How about that? Would you like to never stumble, be so solid in your Christian life Amen. that nothing can shake you? I've seen so many Christians get shaken, get distracted, drawn off by things. You know, this is why what we're doing here, the real Christi Christian life is not a religion. I, I'm going to say this over and over again. These are not outward rituals, ceremonies, whatever it is, you know, things that we do for show. It is inward. It is from within. And it is sincerity. So, you know, <coughs> being stumbled. Yeah, many people, right? They, they start off well. Christians, they start off well. But then job change. Find a girlfriend. 
whatever, right? They don't have a walk with the Lord. And eventually, they get bored of being a Christian. Ah, oh, this is not so interesting. Oh, uh, you know, being a Christian, that means I can't do this, I can't do that. It's no fun. If I, uh, you know, if I uh, be with my friends, it's a lot more fun. A lot more interesting. My job is more interesting. And then slowly, slowly, your walk with the Lord, your distance with the Lord grows. Right. This is a very dangerous condition. <coughs> if we want to make it into the kingdom, we have to take care of the condition of our heart. Amen. Right. So, um, we how much time? Are we? Okay. So I just want to get to read a few verses with you. You know, some of the most the very basic things that we need to do. Okay. Let's see what the word says in John chapter seven. Verse 37. John chapter 7, verses 37 to 39. On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Amen. I like what it says in verse 37 here. It says, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. It doesn't say let him just go to church. It says, come to me and drink. Have you, ever, have you ever checked inside of yourself? Have you ever experienced this before? You know, especially if, you know, I guess if you've tried different things in your life and, or, you know, you, you feel, many times you feel a, a dryness, a thirst, that there has to be more to this life. There has to be a reason, a purpose behind this life. Is it just so that I can go to school, find a job, make some money, have kids, and then die one day? Is that really what life is about? And even as a Christian, do you have a thirst to, have, to know Him more in a deeper way? You know, we should never, we Christians should never ever feel non-thirsty for the Lord. Otherwise, we will stop coming for Him coming to Him. We should always feel that we want to know Him more. Amen. Have you ever had such a feeling in your heart before? Lord, I want to know You more. Amen. I'm hungry and thirsty for You. Amen. If we don't, then maybe we have a problem. There is a problem. Because He says, if you're thirsty, let Him come to Me. If we don't have that, if you're coming, so-called coming to the meeting because if you don't, people are going to call you. Or, uh, you know, if I don't, if I don't, uh, you know, read my Bible, somebody's going to ask, why didn't you read your Bible? Whatever it is, is it because I really desire the Lord? I want to know Him more. Right? So I really like this, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. It doesn't say, let him come and study the Bible. Study the Greek, the Hebrew, and all the different languages, and, and then read the concordance, read this commentary, and that book, and this book. What this author says, what that pastor says, what this... What about just coming to him and drinking? Amen. You know, I must say, this book is a very tasty book. It tastes really good. I really like it, you know. I never, if I read the news, it just makes me angry. <laughs> but if I spend some time in the Word, it just tastes good. Amen. Right? And there's so much richness in it. We, if you don't have that experience, you need to ask the Lord. Lord, help my time with you to be such a rich experience. I want to learn to eat and drink of you. When I spend time with you, I want to feel like I've just had an unsatisfying meal. And 
If we don't have that, it doesn't matter if you know that the Lord is coming back, you see the peace treaty signed, but you don't spend any time with Him. What good will it do if you don't spend time with Him? If you don't have any desire for Him? You know, the most basic command is in Matthew 22. Let's read this, okay? Matthew 22, the most basic commandment of the Lord. The one that sums up everything. And is in verse chapter 22, verse 30. Let's read 36, starting from verse 36. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. You know, a lot of times when people think of sin, they think of, uh, did I cheat, did I lie, murder, steal? But you know, we break this commandment many times. We're always breaking this commandment. You know, we think, oh yeah, I didn't kill anybody. I didn't uh, cheat anybody. I'm a nice person. I smile all the time. You know, I'm polite. I follow the speed limit. But what about this one? Did you ever break this commandment? It's not a suggestion. It's a commandment. It's a commandment from the Lord, right? <laughs> it's, you know, what the commandments are, right? One of the commandments is that we shall not murder. It's an order from the Lord. You have no choice about it. But how much, how often do we really keep this? Right? We, you know, even the Lord said in Matthew 23, He said, you, you, you're focused on so many big things, but you miss the little things. Right? Do we really have this? Right? To love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul and with all our mind. And you better not be saying in your mind right now, I know, I know. Unless you really do it all the time, you don't know. Okay? So it's good to be reminded of this. It is a commandment from the Lord. So let's really do this. Yeah, so, you know, um, so this really is a... So we talked about our daily walk with the Lord. Um, and our prayer, how much time do we spend to pray? You know, I, I, it's sad, but I knew some Christians before they never read the Bible. And eventually they're gone. They could not, uh, they could not keep up in the Christian life. It was too difficult because they did not have any supply. They didn't spend any time to talk to the Lord. Um, there's no way we can ever be qualified to enter the kingdom if we don't spend time to pray, to talk to our Father. You know, when, you're, when you are born again as a Christian, you, this relationship with God, with God as our true Father, this is, He is our real Father. Even the Lord said, your human Father is not your real Father. This God is your real Father. But many times we don't even talk to Him. We don't know anything about Him. So we need to spend time to always to pray, right, to talk to Him. And um, in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, another reason why we need to pray, it says, I'll read this to you, Ephesians 6, verse 12, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Prayer is very important because there are, there are forces of Satan that we cannot see that are always fighting against the kingdom of God and his people. Satan is doing whatever he can to, to break the relationship 
you have with him and to steal away your inheritance. He's trying, ultimately, he's trying to frustrate the plan of God. He's trying to prevent and stop the coming and the establishment of the kingdom. And he wants to take us down with him. And whatever he can do, he'll try. But we need to fight against him, especially in prayer. And that's why if you read a few verses down in verse 18, it says one of the ways to fight against him is praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Praying always. This has to be a part of our normal daily life, our Christian life. Praying always. And how often do we pray for all the saints? Right, to make supplication. It means you're making, uh, you're, you're making requests of the Lord for yourself, for the brothers and sisters, that you can all make it into the kingdom, that you can all mature. You know, when we have a conference like this and we have new ones coming, it's a very good exercise for us to pray for them. Pray that the enemy doesn't take the word away. Pray that the word is established in them. Pray for all of us. You know, especially as we see that the Lord's coming is soon, we have to pray even more diligently. Don't look down on prayer. We need to spend time. Don't be lazy to pray. You know, laziness is one of our worst weaknesses. Somehow, when it comes to my own, my own things, I'm not lazy. You know, if I want to, I don't know what it is, right? If I want to read the news, I'm not lazy, I can read a lot. If I want to watch a TV show, if I want to watch a movie, you know, some movies, they, some uh, TV series, they can be, I've seen them before, they're like uh, many, many episodes. Addictive, you know? I remember they were back in the days of uh, videotapes, right? VHS videotapes. My grandfather would go to the, the store and rent videotapes. And he'd bring home a stack of videotapes like this. And he would sit there watching, right? That's how he spends his time. And, and then later on, when things moved to CDs, DVDs, you see people with stacks of DVDs, like a book, right? A binder, and then you flip it, and it's all <laughs> like a DVDs. And you think about it, each one is like uh, how many hours? And you s multiply that by a uh, hundred episodes. And you just wasted a, a ton of time. Somehow for that we're not lazy, you don't fall asleep. But then you read a chapter, a few verses, and oh. <laughs> You're falling asleep. Why is it? You pray, you start praying and then... <laughs> <laughs> you pray a little bit, a few, few minutes, and you're already falling asleep. If you have a tendency to fall asleep, there are things you can do. Like, uh, today I try not to eat too much for dinner because I know otherwise I'll be sleepy. Take a nap. Drink some coffee. You can do things. You know, yes, our human body is weak. You can try to fight it. But it also sometimes... If it's not our, other than the weakness of our human body, but many times it shows that our appetite <coughs> for the Lord is not enough. Yeah. Our love for Him, our hunger for Him is not enough. You know, that's why Paul is always warning people, the saints, to pray always. Especially because of the principalities and powers that are fighting very hard. Satan doesn't rest. He doesn't fall asleep like we do. Right? So we have to be very diligent. And um, lastly, uh, another one of my points here is that we really need to, one of the things that the Lord talks about, and something that I want to mention here, is that the Lord has given us the Holy Spirit. And this is something that, unfortunately, many believers 
underutilized. Let's look at um, John chapter 14. John chapter 14. John chapter 14, verse 16. And 17. And I will pray the Father, and He will give you another Helper, that He may abide with you forever. The Spirit of Truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees Him nor knows Him. But you know Him, for He dwells with you and will be in you. Amen. And then verse 26. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Amen. Amen. You know, if, if we don't have, if we don't know the Spirit in our daily life, in our Christian life, we don't have a, a consciousness of the Spirit. We don't have a reliance, a dependence on the Spirit. We will, be very, we will definitely get lost in our Christian life. You cannot depend on people. Unfortunately, many believers, we depend on man's speaking, man's words, man's writings. You know, somebody is a well-known preacher, then we look up to him and then everything he says we don't even question. It's very dangerous. And meanwhile, we don't even check with the Spirit. It's very dangerous. Here it says, you know, I will pray, verse 16, I will pray the Father and He will give you another helper. Who is this helper? It's the Holy Spirit. Have you ever tried going to the Spirit for help? Asking Him for help? Do you need help? I think that should be my question. You know what? If you take an honest look at yourself, you will realize we need a lot of help. Sometimes we're just hope, helpless. Right? We need so much help in our, in our spiritual life, in our daily life, you know, in so many areas, even in our practical things, how to manage our life. Or, you know, maybe there's habits or things that in our life that we can't overcome. We're not strong enough. Instead of feeling condemned, but we should, we should go to the Helper. We need to ask Him. This is why prayer is important. You need to say, well, you know, yes, I know God has a, such a high standard for me. I know He wants me to be perfect and He wants me to be like Christ. He wants me to overcome this in my life. He wants me to stop this, but I'm too weak to do it. Maybe you should try, instead of talking to people, and say, Toby, what do I do? Right? Maybe you talk to a brother and say, what do I do? Talk to a counselor, you talk to a psychologist, you talk to so many people, you read books, what do I do? But did you ever try asking the helper? That's his name. Why do you think the Lord gave him that name? It's because his job is to help us. Right? His job is to help us and the best part is he abides with us forever. He's in us. He's always living with us. You don't have to pick up the phone. You don't have to worry he's going on vacation and you can't reach him. You don't have to worry the book will be sold out. You don't have to get in your car. Anything. Right? Anytime. He abides with us. And we can go to him for help. So don't be discouraged. But go to the helper. And you know what? He also is called the Spirit of Truth. Amen. He leads us into the truth. He, also, he leads us to know what the truth is on one hand as well. Right? But He also leads us into the, into the living 
of the truth, the substance of the truth. You know, many times people are get just focused on knowing the truth. What is the truth? They want to know the truth, but then once they know the truth, what do they do with it? Nothing. Oh, good, I know. That's all I know. I know the, I know the Lord is coming back. I know uh, seven years. I know three and a half years. Uh, I know uh, the Antichrist. I know the seventh, eighth kings. I know all these details. But I know, I know. But then, where's the, the truth? Where's the application, the living, and the substance of the truth? So the spirit of truth is not, his job not only is to reveal the truth the knowledge of the truth to you, but His job is also to help us to live out the truth, to apply it. You know, we talked about the coming of the Lord, and if you know that the Lord is coming in such a short time, right, with the assumption that this, is the, the, this president will make it happen, even, not, even if that doesn't happen, your, your attitude should always be to be ready. Right? And if you have that attitude, then that will, the spirit is what makes this, uh, makes the change in you. Right? It's not because of us telling you if you don't, you're going to be left behind and then you're going to go through the, you'll be beheaded by the beast and everything. It's not, that's not the motivating factor. But it's because the spirit of truth makes a change in you. You ask the spirit for help. He makes it happen in you. And because of your love for the Lord, your desire to gain the reward, that you're motivated to do it. Not just to save yourself from the pain of suffering. Of course, there's the fear, the healthy fear of the Lord, right? We have the terror of the Lord. But then, once you escape that, then what? If you have no heart for the Lord, what are you going to do up there for three and a half years while the earth is <laughs> being judged? Right? We need to have, we must have, that's why in this time now, we need to already build this walk with the Lord. We need to know and experience the spirit of truth. Right? It says here, um, yeah, He will dwell with you and will be in you, even better, right? Not just with us, but will be in us. And then in verse 26, again, He, call, he calls Him by His name, the Helper. The Holy Spirit. Okay, He's also called the Comforter. Right? You're comforted because you have help. Right? It, that's His job. If He's not very helpful, you won't be comforted. But He can be called Helper and Comforter because He actually does help. So you can feel comfortable. Right? Yeah, so, and it says the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name, He will teach you all things. This is really wonderful. And I have to say, I, He has, the Lord, the Spirit has taught me. I've experienced this many times, and I need to experience it more. Because I learned that, yes, it's, you can listen to what people say, what people teach, even what I'm saying now. Don't rely on it. You still need to go to the Spirit and learn to be taught by Him. And the most dangerous thing is that when people read the Bible, they don't understand it. And the first thing they do is they go on Google, what does this mean? Or they call up a brother, or they co go open the book, and they check that. But it, that means that we don't believe that He is really the one who will teach us. Do you believe this? Have you ever gone to the Lord, to the Spirit, and said, Please help me to understand. What is the Father's will? What is your purpose? What is this verse really talking about? And it's really amazing because if we are all, if we all learn to be taught by the Spirit, I can guarantee you there will not be arguments about the Word. If we are, if, if we all go to our own sources and we're just have our own opinions, we read the Bible with our own opinions and interpretations, I can guarantee you there will be arguments and disputes. And I've been in those types of uh, uh, Bible studies, they call them Bible studies before, where everybody comes with an opinion. 
and you think, no, no, that can't be right, and you, and you say, no, I'm right, and the other person says, I'm right, and at the end of it, nobody knows what really the verse is talking about, right? But if, if we all learn to be taught by the Holy Spirit, and the Spirit opening our inner eyes, giving us revelation, that's why Paul prays for the Spirit of wisdom and revelation, and in Colossians 1, he prays for, the, for spiritual understanding. Then you, will really, and you, then you will really understand what it means. And when the Spirit gives you understanding, you will not forget it. And it will make a difference in your life. It will definitely make a difference. But if your understanding of the Word and of the truth, come, if it comes from man, I can tell you, you'll get confused about it. Maybe, uh, maybe now you're okay, but then uh, in a couple weeks you'll say, what was that again? Uh, I don't remember. Let me ask the brother again. And then when something else, similar sounding, that could be right or wrong, you don't even know anymore. Which one is right? This is how so many people get confused with the Word, and they get led astray because their foundation in the Word is so weak. They did not receive revelation from the Lord. Because many Christians think they cannot understand the Bible. And this is one of the lies of the enemy. In order to understand the Bible, I need to, be, I need to have credentials. Or I need to be a, a big brother, an elder brother. But me, as, a, as maybe if I'm a, a, you know, a young sister or a new believer, Oh, I could never understand it. That's not true at all. You have to try to go to the Lord right, and be poor in spirit and ask Him, Lord, I want to know. And this will really make a difference in our life when the Lord reveals it. And, um, yeah, so I talked about that. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, I just want to emphasize this matter about not depending on man. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verses 1 to 5. Let's read this together. And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God." Amen. That is a really amazing verse. If you consider who wrote that. Paul, this was written by Paul, and you have to understand that Paul, he has a lot of training, uh, religious training. He knows the, the scripture very well. That's why you see in all the books, all the letters that he wrote, he quoted. He was able to quote the word. And he, the Lord showed him so many things, many great revelations um, using the word. And, but he never used human wisdom in his preaching and his teaching. What, did it, what does it say here? He says, I did not come to you with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimonies of God. He could have. He's a very good speaker, I'm sure. You know, he, look at all the things he wrote. He could give a wonderful conference. You know, the best conference ever, I'm sure, right? <laughs> Other than the Lord Jesus himself, right? He could give a great conference. And he could write amazing uh, books that would sell lots, right? He could make a lot of money with that. But, uh, but he didn't. He said, I determined not to know anything among you 
except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. To know the Lord, isn't that wonderful, and His crucifixion. I was with you in weakness and fear and in much trembling, not in pride and boosting myself up. Look at me, I'm big brother Paul. I'm the Apostle Paul. You better listen to me, right? Look at me, look at what I've done. I'm Paul. Right? He never said anything like that. But today, we all want to be somebody. We want to be someone great. And he says, even his speech and his preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom. Many times when we preach the gospel, we're talking to our friends about the Lord, or explaining something to a brother or sister, or even giving a message. We want, we want to persuade them. We want to try to convince them. Oh, you know, my friend here, he's not believing yet. Maybe it's because I didn't convince him right. Wait, wait, you wait here. I'm going to get this brother. Maybe he can say it better than me, and then he'll be convinced. And then, no, no, he didn't say, well, I'm going to bring another brother, and then maybe he can convince you. And it all didn't work. They must all be not good at convincing. They didn't explain it right. You know, if somebody could see the truth by explaining, that would have, there would be the perfect book that could have all the perfect explanations. Everybody would be a believer by now. And everybody would be a first fruit. Because all you have to do is have the right explanation. If it was that easy. But again, you have to realize this is not a matter of how well something can be explained. This is a spiritual fight. You're trying to, when you try to preach the gospel, you're not trying to convince them using a touching story, using good, funny jokes, or uh, using so many different things, using, it says, human wisdom, even using wise words to try to convince people. That's not what you're trying to do. You're, what you're really trying to do, you're trying to free them from prison. You're trying to save them, rescue them from the hold of the enemy. And you're trying to take away the, the veils that are covering their eyes. These are spiritual matters. Right? So convincing is not going to work. And that's why it says, Paul it says, what did he do? It was demonstration of the Spirit and power. If we are not serving the Lord, or preaching, or teaching, talking to people about the Lord with the Spirit and the Spirit's power, all right, 2 Timothy chapter 1, uh, verse 7, it says, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. If we don't know this how to use and depend on the spirit of power to change people's hearts. And remember, it's a matter of changing people's hearts too. Then there's no way. Even if that person is convinced, it will not last very long. Because the foundation is not from the spirit. It wasn't the spirit that opened the person's eyes. It was a man. And if ever one day that man that convinced this brother were to go astray, it'll cause this brother also to fall as well. But if it came from the Spirit, nothing can, it will not, it'll be a very firm what the person sees. That's why we really have to learn. And it's a very sad thing that today among many Christians is that we omit, we leave out the Spirit in our service, in our work, in our daily life. We don't know anything about Him. We don't depend on Him. We don't learn from Him. We don't, you know, He works in our conscience to warn us and He speaks to us. We don't know anything about Him. And the sad thing is when a new believer, sometimes when someone is a new believer, the first thing is you do is you give them books to read. Read this book, read that book, and then, you know, you're uh, this teaching, that teaching, do this, do that, this method, that method, but then you don't even teach them to know the Spirit. If they don't know the Spirit, 
then they will not know where they're going in their Christian life. So that's why I'm saying, you know, brothers and sisters, if we want to prepare and get ready for the Lord's coming, we better start having a walk with the Lord. Right? To have the Spirit working in us to help us. The Lord healing us, teaching us. Right? Revealing what is hidden in our heart that needs to be dealt with. Knowing, uh, knowing uh, details about His coming is not enough. I'm not saying you don't have to know. It's good to know. But we have to, we have to take care of a lot of the basic foundational things of our life. Otherwise, when He comes, we'll be surprised. Well, I knew you were supposed to come, but why am I not taken? <laughs> you know, In Galatians 5, it says, Those who practice the works of the flesh will definitely not inherit the kingdom of God. Only those who walk according to the Spirit. Not those who go to church on Sundays. Those who practice the Christian rituals or whatever. But those who walk according to the Spirit. If you want to enter the kingdom, we have to take care of that. Okay? Alright. That is it. Let's have some prayer.